Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference channel. My name is Jesse Day, and today we are joined by the CEO of Cambridge House, the host of the Jay Martin Show, and the producer of the VRIC. It's Jay Martin. Good to see you. Good to be here, Jesse. I'm looking forward to this. I'm looking forward to it, too, as I am to the conference itself. So I want to start off with what you are seeing as some of the main macro themes in the commodity space that you're seeing come up in 2023 and that make you excited for this year's VRIC. Yeah, there's no shortage this year of, of threads to follow. That's for sure. I said that last year. We were leading up to last year's event that I thought every single corner of the world, some part of the sky is falling. And this year, there's just as much to talk about. And so... You know, people always ask, like, what's my prediction for, the, you know, the next few years or the 2020s or what can people expect to hear about at the conference in that context? And all I have to say is that the more people I talk to, the higher my conviction gets that the 2020s are going to continue to be how the 2020s have been, which is just an unprecedented, unpredictable rise of chaos, volatility and uncertainty. And people are starting to recognize this in terms of what kind of threads am I following right now. I'm seeing a massive trend of people rushing towards stability. And this is happening and not just stability, but trying to remove their dependence and become a little bit more sovereign. And I'm seeing this at the micro scale, you know, retail investors are just civilly speaking, right? Uh, there's a trend of people moving from big urban metropolises to small towns where they just have a bit more of a community vibe and a bit more dependence. We're seeing this at the commercial level. Companies are showing up their balance sheets, reducing G&A, and re reducing their dependence on the equity markets. And then at a state level, we're seeing record central bank gold buying. And I mean record central bank gold buying to the point where treasuries are holding more gold than they have since the 70s. And in addition, even more interesting is they're repatriating that gold. We're seeing countries like Germany, who historically always stored their gold in New York because Europe, being a tiny continent with dozens of nations on it, always descends into war. This is the history of the continent. And so they've chosen historically to store their gold overseas. They're now repatriating that, even though there's a hot war happening right now, right next door. They feel more comfortable having that gold close to home, all of those threads. And I'm doing the same thing. I mean, you know, we were just chatting before we hit record here. Whenever I'm doing something, purchasing something, feeling a certain way or thinking something, I'm not some novel thinker. I'm not ahead of the curve. Typically, I'm part of a wave or a trend. And in the last year, I've doubled my physical gold holdings. So why would I be doing that? It's because I'm seeing the same signals that everyone else is. I'm getting the same inputs as everybody else. And I just believe we have no idea what's around the next corner, but I think this decade of transformation, call it the great reset, call it whatever you want, you know, we're entering a new era of distrust, right? For my whole life, we've, ma we've maintained, you know, a fragile layer, but a layer of trust globally. We've been able to rely on cheap labor from countries like China, cheap energy from countries like Russia and cheap cash from the United States and globally coordinate accordingly. And that era is over and we don't know how the cards are going to fall, right? We don't know how the new alliances are going to shake out. There's so much unknown, right? And this, this percolates all the way down to the consumer, the retail investor, individuals like myself. So even I am include increasing my treasury right now. And so if there's one thread I'm focused most on right now, it's like, how do we become more durable? And we're seeing this from a central bank level all the way down to people like me. How do we become more durable? and prepare for the future. Yeah, and I'm wondering when it comes to gold and, and maybe even silver as well, when we might start to see more institutional buying in this space. I, I think more retail investors are waking up to it. 2022 was an unprecedented year in terms of the bond market. We've never seen bonds perform so poorly right along with stocks. So I think that's kind of shaking up a lot of firmly held beliefs that the 60-40 portfolio was, was the path to safety. You've got a lot of people out there saying 60-40 portfolio might just be done. You, that, that, that might not be a thing for quite some time. So do you think we're going to eventually see more institutional buying, specifically in gold and, and maybe in the silver space in the years ahead as kind of this uncertainty takes hold yeah the reason that i think we do is strictly like i watch sentiment you know you, you kind of play that the hand that you have and i interview three money managers per week for the jay martin show um super fortunate that i get to hear so many perspectives and what i try to look for during those interviews and i mean i could interview you know 100 different money managers i'm going to hear 100 different ideas and theses but 
typically there's consensus in one or two things, not all the time, but sometimes we, we find that everyone's agreeing a little bit on at least one thread. And right now, what I can tell you without question is that everybody's increasing their exposure to gold. And for you know, an investor with a precious metals background, maybe they're increasing it a lot, but a lot of sector agnostic money managers are increasing it regardless, right? And these are not gold bugs. These are individuals who often don't own any gold, but right now they feel like they want to. And that kind of consensus matters because even if every individual that I have on my show is only increasing at 1%, collectively, that's a tsunami of cash moving to one small asset class. We know what happens in those scenarios. And I'm watching the US dollar trade like everybody else. I mean, there's a reason, right? That's it's it's the only chart that looks great over the last 18 months, right? And because of all the trends we just talked about, all the chaos and uncertainty, people go to that safe haven. And and you know, the US dollars reflected that, right? It's now the most overcrowded trade on the planet. So it's no longer super safe. It actually looks like a bubble, it looks pretty frothy. And so people that entered that trade for stability. They're now going to recognize that they're not going to find it there because this has become a frothy bubble trade. They're going to look for somewhere else. So where are they going to go? They're going to go somewhere they can justify with the same rationale that they bought U.S. dollars in the first place, which is that safe harbor, right? That stability and certainty. And there's not too many things on the planet that offer that as a second choice to the U.S. dollar. But one of them we know, and it's, it is gold, right? People harp all day long right now. They're upset that gold hasn't performed given war and inflation and all of this stuff. You know, and I've got a good buddy who was just in my ear recently. He bought a kilogram bar to diversify his wealth. He was really upset. It hadn't done anything in his his words, right? And I'm looking at him like, that's the whole point of a safe haven. Like, imagine if it was volatile, right? Like, what about that is gives you certainty? You know what I mean? About about protecting wealth. If the price is jumping up and down like the price of Bitcoin, then it's not serving that need for you, right? You want the rock to be a boring rock. I mean, that's the point of it. That's why it's the only metal that's consistently been a monetary metal because of that stability, right? And I think the same reason that people flooded to the US dollar, there's going to be a large percentage of people. I mean, we got to ask the question, where's that money going to go next, right? When people, but no one wants to be the last to sell. So we're going to start seeing people peel out of the US dollar trade. They're already doing it, right? Look at the chart. This has been going on for a few weeks now. Where are they going to go next? And that's what we want to find out. Where's the puck going to go next? Right. So let's step outside the precious metals and take a look at the broader commodities complex and any opportunities you're seeing there. There's a lot of stories that have been unfolding. There's the proliferation of nuclear energy, which is very bullish for uranium. There's copper and the electrification of the world and its uh, implications for green technologies. Um, we've got the oil and gas sector heavily underinvested in for the past decade, still being underinvested in all sorts of ESG mandates, causing funds to withdraw. But there is met, you, these companies are ridiculous valuations. Um, you've got the battery metals, lithium, graphite, cobalt, etc. What are the main commodities that you have your eye on right now in the stories that that you're looking at outside of the precious metals? Yeah, you just listed a lot of them. And I've never seen sentiment so positive in the nuclear and uranium sector as I've seen it today. And just for context, I've been hosting investment conferences for 12 years. And so I watch sentiment. I see how what you know how many people show up to a feature if we're talking about nuclear uranium versus how many people show up to a feature if we're talking about uh, cobalt and lithium. So, you know, I've never seen sentiment so strong for the right reasons. I, I wouldn't say that it's getting overheated. I wouldn't say that the sector is getting ahead of itself. I mean, you look at the company's position through the Athabasca Basin, most of them are still down 50% from their highs. Like the sector is not overbought whatsoever. Um, but the world, I mean, ener any energy thread right now is getting a lot of attention as it needs to, right? We're in an energy crisis. No one knows what the solution is going to be. Um, but for that reason, uranium is getting a lot of love and we're going to see a ton of uranium content at the VRIC coming up at the end of January, lots and lots. Uh, but I'm also watching the renewable energy trend and not necessarily for the right reasons. I think this is an industry that's very much misunderstood and renewable energy itself is a big misnomer. You know, yeah, renewable in the sense that the sun is always shining and the wind's always going to blow, but in order to harvest and store this energy, nothing about that's renewable. You need an, you know, an extraordinary large sum of new metals that have to be extracted from the earth. So I expect, even though you know, the term renewable is questionable, the world's going in that direction. And the demand that's going to get put on 
yes, cobalt and lithium, but more importantly, copper and nickel really as the hallmark metals within this. I mean, you know, you can look at cobalt, you can look at lithium, you can look at vanadium, manganese, all these obscure metals. If you want to and go there, if you're looking for those asymmetric uh, risk reward benefits, because you can make a ton of money. If you want something a bit more stable and steadfast in that market, copper's not going anywhere. Nickel's not going anywhere. I mean, those are the fundamental metals in the energy transition, no matter what direction the sector goes, no matter how the batteries end up being manufactured and what components are in demand, copper and nickel are guarantees. And so I actually play that part of the energy market most, you know, more so than I go anywhere else, just because I believe, you know, if you're only going to look at what the common denominator is, it's, you know, the best conductor in the world, right? And therefore I look at those two. Very interesting. Um, we've got an all-star panel of guests at this year's VRIC, an amazing lineup. Some of the brightest minds in commodities and sound money converging in Vancouver. What are some of the main themes and points of interest that you're expecting to hear from this stellar lineup this year? So everything we just discussed for sure, we'll be talking about um, a lot of the macro uh, trends that we just covered. Everyone's curious about what the US dollar trade is going to look like over the next year. Everyone's curious what's going to occur with rates and what kind of damage has already been done that we don't know about yet. Those ripple effects that will come to the surface over the next 18, 24 months. Um, and we put together a couple interesting features this year, specifically, you know, Canada is a country that rarely makes international headlines, but we've made a ton of them in the last 24 months. And there's a lot going on in this country right now, which is worth discussing. And I shared recently in a newsletter, um, you know, during like the fall of 2021, when a lot of the world was still in some kind of a lockdown, I traveled extensively through the United States. And what I loved about that is that every time I crossed the state border, I got to experience a completely different policy, a completely different style of risk management and how they were dealing with that, that global threat, right? It was, it was a completely new experience each time, which I loved because it allowed me to sort of go to the state, which had the risk management policy that I, I appreciated, right? And I'm more libertarian and I appreciate the ability to make my own decisions. And so I would trend towards places like Idaho, Arizona, Texas, et cetera. You know, in Canada, right, things function a little bit differently. We're more federally governed coast to coast. But, you know, we do have provinces and territories like the states in the U.S. And those provinces and territories do have a bit of sovereignty just relating to different things. But right now, there's a massive rift emerging between the provinces within Canada, specifically the provinces, or what I would call the breadbasket of the country, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and now it looks like Manitoba which are the energy haven for this country. I mean, this is where so much of our nation's revenue has come from, is extracting resources from Alberta and Saskatchewan. But, you know, that extraction industry has been in conflict with our federal government increasingly for the last couple of years, to the point where the federal government has completely hamstrung and landlocked our resources to prevent us from participating in the global economy with the resources that the whole world needs that we have and could could export. Um, and so we're now seeing this coalition form in the center of our country. And it's between countries like Alberta with the Alberta Sovereignty Act recently just passed new legislation. The Saskatchewan First Act recently just passed new legislation. And Manitoba is now in conversation. And the point of this is they're trying to build a coalition to create some kind of a safe harbor from the decision-making, in their opinion, the short-sighted decision-making of our federal government. And they figure if they band together They'll have a stronger voice and they can get our products to market because our our federal government is largely focused on, you know, hydrogen goals for 2050 and fossil fuel free economies for 50 years down the road. And those are really easy things to say. But let's just get real here. We're simply scoring moral virtue points. There's nothing about that that's actually real. Nothing about that can be promised. And so we're seeing this dispute now emerge in Canada. And honestly, I love it because I feel like our federal leadership has been largely unchecked and any power unchecked is dangerous. So to put this on stage at the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference, I'm inviting a couple of our former premiers of the provinces, specifically the former premier of Saskatchewan, which is a country that, I mean, let me just say it, they got the world by the balls in terms of the resources they have access to. Um, and so we've got the former premier coming to join me on stage, Brad Wall, amazing individual. I've also invited the former premier of British Columbia, Christy Clark, because, you know, on either side of Alberta, right, the Texas of Canada, 
You've got Saskatchewan to the east, which has largely been supportive of extractive industries, and British Columbia on the west, which has largely been opposed. And so, like, I always want to hear from both sides of any argument, make sure I'm identifying my blind spots, trying to see the issue clearly. But they'll both be joining me on stage for a one on one, and I'll be growing them on uh, the direction of this country and what our future looks like. Very fascinating. I'm looking really forward to that. Now, the tagline of the Jay Martin Show is investing for personal sovereignty. Now, one interesting thing that I've come across in also speaking with a lot of commodities investors, fund managers who are involved in commodities, is it seems to be a theme that they all kind of value, especially those investors in precious metals. And it seems like those who invest in commodities kind of have their eyes wide open to this sorts of government overreach. And, you know, the, the very idea of sound money is to get outside of the financial system. So what, why do you think it is that commodities investors are able to see the bigger picture and kind of step outside of the box that everybody else is in? And, and I, I think that's an underlying theme to this year's VRIC. So just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, that's a really good question, you know, and, as you're asking, and I was thinking about this, like where does that foundation, that belief system come from? That you're right, you see in a lot of commodities investors. And depending on what sector of the commodities industry you're looking at, whether it's you know hard commodities like metals, whether it's soft commodities like coffee, agriculture, either way, either direction you go, you get back to a more basic approach to necessities, right? There's discretionary demands in life and necessary demands in life. And the commodities bucket kicks that necessary box. And so if you're a, a metals investor like I am, I think there's always a part of you that is going to always be a history buff. It's just required. And simultaneously, I don't think you can be a student of history and not have an understanding of the value of gold. It just, they come together. If you look at the rise and subsequent fall of every single empire, you know, you're going to see gold playing a role. The same thing with any market crash, right? And so we don't know what the future holds. It's impossible to predict. You know, I tend to put a lot of emphasis on theories like the Lindy effect, right? That states essentially, you know, the best predictor of how long a technology idea or piece of content will exist is how long has it existed so far? You know, that book that was just published last year that became a bestseller, will it be, you know, um, as popular 100 years down the road? Probably not. Probably for another year, though, that's that's predictable, right? But that book that's been popular for 500 years, probably going to be popular for another 500, right? And, you know, that's why people put more emphasis on gold as um, a future monetary instrument than I believe they should put on something like Bitcoin, which maybe has a place. And I'm an investor in Bitcoin all day long, and I love the technology and I'm very bullish on it. But it's too new for us to have any idea of what this could be in 20, 30 years, because it hasn't even existed for 20, 30 years, right? And disruptive technologies come and go all the time. So, you know, I think that there's a primitive, and I say this endearingly, there's a primitive nature to a lot of commodities investors. I definitely own that, right? Like, the, you know, people would say that holding hard rocks in a safe next to your gun collection is kind of primitive, right? But it's like, Man, if it gives me peace of mind and a good night's sleep, that's how I'm living. And that's how I'm living. So, you know, and and uh, I think on the soft commodity front too, my, you know, I come from a family of, of farmers from Saskatchewan, actually, and they're just salt of the earth, simple human beings who understand how to make a dollar. And that's what you'll often find in the commodities business. Well, it's been awesome chatting. Before I let you go, is there anything else you wanted to highlight about the conference that we haven't discussed so far that the people can look forward to if they attend? You know, lots of uh, my channel favorites will be at this show, right? Grant Williams, he's a hard get to bring over to Vancouver uh, because he's often based in Singapore. He's the he's the author of the letter, Things That Make You Go, Hmm. You know, Brent Johnson, now based in Puerto Rico, again, tough to get him over to Vancouver. But these individuals are, are very excited to come this year, and they haven't come in a couple of years, but they feel like the time is now. Robert Kiyosaki coming up from Arizona, Lynette Zhang coming up from Arizona, Mark Moss, coming up from Southern California slash Puerto Rico. Peter Schiff said he's going to come if I can find him a private jet. So we're working on that right now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny. It's because he's in Puerto Rico and it is tough to get to Vancouver, but there's like six or seven people now from Puerto Rico that are coming. So he might just pull the trigger on the jet and get Peter here too. But the roster really is, you know, better than it's been in many, many years. I, I pour my heart and soul into this conference and the agenda. I'm really looking forward to it. It's maybe the, mo the most fun two days of my entire year because we work so hard for months to put it together. 
If you want to connect with Rick Rule, if you want to connect with Grant Williams, they're there to talk to you. Come to the show. When they get off stage, they hit the trade show and they're there to have conversations. So it's a great place to build your network out like that. And perfect segue to tickets are free. There's a link in the description, guys. So it's definitely worth making a trip out to Vancouver if, if you don't live there. And if you do live there, well, you, you have no excuse. You, you've got to be there. It's going to be an amazing conference. Thanks so much for joining us today, Jay. And I will see you at the VRIC January 29th and 30th. Thanks, Jesse. We actually need to have a damn good recession. The Russian economy is a gas station run by the mafia. $41 trillion has been created out of nothing. There's a stranglehold in China on most of these resources. The outlook and fundamentals for the metals remains very, very strong.